Practice, Practice with Krista and Kayla, a podcast in which we talk about practice and practice practice of various kinds. Missed out all the times we had together. Think of whether we would actually have our time. Hello. Hello. Krista, Hello. we have Hello. with us today the one and only Lily Mobies. Uh, a little about Lily. Lily, who is our friend and an artist, uh, is a Brooklyn-based artist working in textiles, printmaking, and painting. She has been a resident artist at organizations including the Textile Art Center, Museum of Art and Design, Drop Forge and Tool, and has had her work featured in exhibitions in New York City, DC, and San Francisco. She graduated with a BA from Barnard in 2015 and is currently an MFA candidate at the Parsons School of Design. Welcome, Lily. Welcome. Thank you, guys. It's good to be here. So to start us off, we got a homework assignment, a practice homework assignment from Lily to, at the end of each day, this is a practice she does, um, record from memory what we did each day. A little, what did you call it? I can't remember. It's a... Studio debrief. Studio debrief. Um, So I guess to start out, Kayla, we can talk a little bit about how that worked for us. I learned a lot from it, Lily. It was, I'm gonna keep doing it. Yay! I mostly learned that I spend a lot of time doing nothing, which is not yay. Um. <laughs> Wait, let, let's, let's dog hear that. We can come back to that. Okay, perfect. <laughs> well, maybe, I think it would be great if Lily, uh, do you wanna like describe for us a little bit about what this yeah. practice is and how you arrived at doing it and just spl- splain it. Yeah, totally. And I apologize, my electronic litter box is going off in the background. Um, we can't hear it. But, you know, it's a part of my practice. Um, so, Studio Debrief. I got this idea from the movie Free Solo. Um, have you guys seen that? No. Mr. Alex Honnold. I haven't seen it, but I know of, I know of it. (laughs) Yeah, so I forget his name, but he would, you know, he does free climbs and, you know, up up rock faces. And as he's doing them or or practicing them, at the end of every day, he'll make a log about, like, what happened on his climb. Like, I ran into this formation, I did this footwork, ended up, you know, this is what happened around here, and... You know, obviously, in that instance, those those journal entries are important for his life because he needs to remember that stuff so he doesn't fall off the, the, the rock face and die. But um, it, I thought it was interesting because he's just writing literally what happened for memory for, like, during his free climbing practice. And free climbing, if any of your listeners don't know, is where you climb up something with a rock face with absolutely no anchors uh, or, like, nothing tying you to the rock face. It's, like, super scary. Um, So at the time, I was finding my studio practice really frustrating. And, you know, occasionally I would journal. Um, I like journaling, but I find it can be, for me at least, when you know I have a lot of thoughts and a lot of feelings and a lot of judgment, it can be kind of dangerous territory because, you know, I could end up journaling about something in my studio and end up in my childhood, and that's like just not always practical. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so what I started doing was writing notes about kind of free solo style about what happened during my studio practice, kind of as if I was an archaeologist writing about what Lily, the artist, did during, during in her natural habitat. So kind of separating the, the artist part of me that kind of has license to experiment and license to fail from Lily outside the studio who, you know, kind of needs to stay grounded. Um, so what I would do is write 1015 to 1030, drawing warm-ups, 10.30 to 
1045 stared into space. 1045 to 1050 got really frustrated. And again, I'm not going into the why behind that, but noticing when those things happen. And then maybe 11 to 12, um, organized fabric, 12 to 1, did some sewing with cool fabric I found, and, you know, on and on, because I think that those moments of staring into space, of getting into getting frustrated, aren't bad things. They're, they're normal things that happen, at least for my creative process. And um, tracking what they are kind of helps me later on to see, like, okay, wh what is normal for me? What is what happens for me as a creative person in my studio and how can I recognize that when it happens and work through it or, or take advantage of it. So, so it's kind of like getting to know the artist, yourself as an artist, without judgment and without kind of the volatility of the, the feelings that come with it and designating your own time and place for journaling about those feelings or journaling about that frustration. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, that's the studio debrief. That's so, that's so awesome. I love the, I love the imagery of like imagining, <laughs> this is like a false equivalence, right? But maybe it's not actually. Uh, I love the imagery of like your studio practice as like you also just climbing up the face of the face of a mountain, like about to fall off of it. Like it's, oh, it gosh. feels that precarious sometimes. Yeah, totally. And you know, it's also the, the debriefs are a way of kind of respecting that journey and, and really documenting it. Like, I don't know when I'm really in the swing of things, like I'll take photographs if I'm doing the, the debrief manually in like a physical journal um, I have this little photo printer you can get them for for not too much money and like print small pictures from my phone that I tape so I can see like refer to it later oh that's the thing and then like after a week I see how that that project evolved or like this is my studio wall um, so so yeah it's kind of respecting the practice and respecting its evolution um, it's kind of honoring how, like, shitty it is. <laughs> like, climbing up a rock face on the system. I'm not saying that's shitty, but, like, it's scary. Or, and, like, it's, I'm sure yeah. it's hard. And you probably sweat. And I get, like, rocks in your face. The same things happen in the studio in their own way. Like, it can be really tough. But that's just part of it. So you mentioned, like, a notebook and maybe taking some photos of your of your work for the day um so do you do you do this all like analog in a notebook what's your like logistical system of doing this do you have like a designated journal where you write these debriefs yeah so um i i always have an art journal and um i'll do studio notes during the day and then a studio debrief at the end of the day and i like to give it a few hours because at like the end of the day I usually like i'm hungry or i have to to you know, like clean the bathroom or whatever and then it's kind of at nighttime a, a kind of something I do looking back a few hours later but um, yeah it's mostly been an analog notebook and I keep it open with studio notes because for me I, I don't really necessarily think in words but for some reason when I'm doing things with my hands like the words come or like I'll remember things and I like to, to try and record them like, oh yeah, I really need to look up um, John de Buffet or whatever, like this, the, the color red reminded me or oh yeah, or I don't know, like words will float through my head. So I try to write them down um, about studio notes and then I'll do studio debrief after that. Um, but lately due to the one and only Kayla Chambers, um, I have been doing this digitally, um, and it's going it's going pretty well. I mean, it's all discipline. Like you've got, I've just got to make sure I do it. I forgot to do it the last two days um, in the program Notion. I don't know how much I should go into that, but um, digitally has been has been cool as well. Like the most important thing for me is that I do it. Um, mm. And I, I forgot to mention this, but two details I include that are that aren't 
like strictly what happened, but I'll write down uh, three or four things I'm under the influence of and Ooh. a few feelings. So under the influence of is like, like what are my being influenced by? Like what's in my head a lot? So maybe it's my new tattoo. I'm kind of the in, under the influence of that or this podcast that I'm listening to. It, like it can be anything. When I was watching Love Island, Love Island is like shows up as an influence like 40 times. Because That's I was thinking so about it, like no judgment, just that. like what I'm under the influence of right now. Yeah. Totally. And that's so interesting to track those things because it's so easy to forget what is influencing us under certain times, especially for me, something like Love Island that that's I don't know, the TV show I'm watching, but that totally influences what you're making. Like it can't not. Yeah, or it influences my mental state, kind of, yeah. you know. Well, and like, Krista, you read so much, too. It could be cool to track, you know, what you're reading or, um, yeah, podcast, just to know, like, what's in my head. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. It's not just Love Island. I want listeners to know that. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have more influences than that. But, you know, Love Island comes calms the soul in its own way (laughs) and it's nice to get those sort of like lateral connections where you think that I mean we don't we don't you know as much as we like to think that we're amazing especially as Gemini's (laughs) we're amazing (laughs) at compartmentalizing that like actually the you know uh, lizard review channel that you watched it actually does <laughs> does have a an influence on your art practice but who know until you wrote it down totally or like mm. like an ad maybe it wasn't an ad it was like one of those like recommended for you Instagram videos that was just someone slicing a band-aid a little bit and Ooh. braiding it so that the band-aid stayed on their finger it was like a life hack that kept like, I meant one day, I was like, oh, I should do that with fabric and weave canvases together. A Band-Aid Instagram. Like, who knew? Hmm. That really speaks to our time of being hyper on the internet, too. Like, everything we take in is through some form of media, for the most part. Digital media. And it's, I think, really easy to, like, discount that as, like, just Instagram or something kind of frivolous. But it's not. It's where we live most of the time now. Encounters. Yeah. Counters? Many encounters a day. Oh. <laughs> like my kitchen counters. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> no. So so these these debriefs, do you like return to them ever? Uh, are they do they serve more the purpose of just like getting down what happened at the end of the day, like emptying your brain, doing the dishes kind of thing? Or and or do you review them at any point in the future? Yeah, that's um, kind of another thing that I, I try to practice. And I don't do it enough, um, but it's going back through my art notebooks and annotating them. Um, mm. <clears throat> I like to, I'm not great at keeping all of my ideas in my head at once. And so going back through and annotating them once a week, I remember like, oh yeah, that's right, I did do that experiment with materials and then I put it in like a drawer somewhere that I can't see. Or, oh yeah, like Mm. these artists were recommended to me in Crit, I never looked them up. Um, Or, oh yeah, like that, that did happen and I'm having the same kind of struggle today. All right, this is normal. For me because I will absolutely forget everything that's in them unless I review them so like I'm on spring break right now from school and in my list of things to do for break it was like annotate grad three which is the name of my third grad school notebook because I'm like a nerd um, <laughs> so yeah going back through and annotating them like I'll, I have highlighters I'll, I'll highlight with like this is an idea Maybe I'll rewrite things, but, um, but, but yeah, and especially if I'm having a rough time, um, you know, if, if the work is frustrating or I just feel like everything I make is really dumb, why am I doing this? Why am I wasting time and, and space on this thing that this pursuit that has no, 
you know, I don't know if I can sustain in my life. You know, going back through and seeing what's happened is, you know, and that this ha- that's a normal part of a cycle in, in art making that's helpful and validating because it doesn't feel like that in the moment. It feels like all encompassing I am wasting my life um so yeah and Krista you mentioned like you weren't doing anything in a in a a friend who's in my program told me that she was had was given the assignment by a mentor to spend an entire day just looking at a painting just staring at the painting like spend the entire day looking at it and asking yourself what's going on and like what what or just like why are you making the decisions that you're making just like think about it but spend the entire day looking so I think Hmm. that there is a lot of value in stopping and looking I find myself doing that a lot I'll just look and I always feel like what am I (laughs) doing what am I doing like why am I doing this but I think you you mentioned like you weren't getting you were just staring into space like I, I do think that there is a lot of value in that so don't. I agree and I think my problem is not that because I do also love staring into space and looking at my plants like I know Kayla also <laughs> does um for me I think it's a lot of like watching YouTube or too much being on the internet as like a form of doing nothing and distracting myself from gotcha. my interior world yeah is that's more what I observed I wish I was staring into space more (laughs) I'm really I'm really interested in how this how practicing this week uh this studio debrief system that Lily has um has kind of designed applies to you know coming from Lily and and in my own application it's it's like specifically an art practice but Krista, as, as a person who's in a program for design, who has, you have like deadlines and assignments and specific things that you have to produce, it's less like, um, I mean, probably some of this, but like it's maybe a little less like you're climbing up an unknown rock face kind of hanging on the edge. And in your case, there are like specific flags that you have to touch. There's a sport yeah. that probably is a correct <laughs> analogy. Like, you know, the skiing one where you have to go through the gates or whatever. <laughs> like there's like Downhill set... skiing or slalom. Right. That's slalom. I've heard of sports. I've seen the Olympics. Um, <laughs> but like, yeah, sl- slalom. <laughs> um but like for you, I mean, and correct me if I'm wrong, but what I understand is that you have specific assignments and outputs and goals that you need to to reach in addition to like the greater kind of arc of your own thesis work, which is a little bit more like a rock face that you're climbing up without mm-hmm. equipment. Whereas I feel yeah. like for me and for you, Lily, uh, in an art practice that's that's totally self-directed there's not like necessarily a flag that you're supposed to touch or a an end goal it's just sort of like making your way along a rock face and at some point you might end up somewhere (laughs) Hmm. that feels like a big difference now that you put it in terms of that metaphor because like I mean, I think I've also just been in a slump. And so, like, seeing that in my, like, daily recaps has been, like, the biggest takeaway. But, like, the flags are what get me to actually, like, do things. And, like, yes, I'm procrastinating a little bit. So I'm doing them, like, later in the day. And I'm, like, working later at night. And that's, like, a sign of me just kind of, like, not wanting to, I don't I don't know, be present at, or do work. I don't know. That's a that's a therapy session, not a podcast <laughs> session. <laughs> but um, like, I think there was still there's still a lot of um, and I'm curious to see too, Kayla, like how you felt the daily recaps worked compared with Lily. Um, but there still is that sense of like. Or, like, having to reach a goal, it's still useful to be like, well, how am I using my time? Like, am I aware of how I'm using my time? Um, like, that kind of, I think, was the biggest takeaway of, like, oh, I'm not I'm not aware of how I'm using my time. There, It's still a lot of empty time. Like, I don't have classes during the day. The time I'm spent at my desk or, like, working on things here is, like, still an open, self-directed chunk. 
that like I need to figure out how to organize for myself and like figure out what works best for me. And maybe like starting with this sort of audit where you do a sort of daily like what, you know, how long do things actually take? Because <laughs> like the, you know, the amount yeah. of time we designate to an assignment or to a, a, a chunk of work can sometimes be really different when we're planning it than like when we're reflecting on it. Like, yeah. And, and so these studio debriefs um, can serve to like show you what you actually need to spend your time on. Yeah. And I think a lot of things take less time or at least like this stage of like my thesis. A lot of things are taking less time than I think they do. But I'm like constantly thinking about them and kind of mulling them over and like wondering which direction to go that it feels like I'm spending an infinite, an infinite amount of time on it. But it's like things kind of don't take that long as we think they do unless it's like a really big project. Um, I think sometimes things don't take that long, but what I have found through creative, through my own creative work, which is, you know, which is in a different, a slightly different field, but ideas, creative ideas can take a long time to like integrate and settle mm. and kind of like knit themselves together in your brain or, or wherever it is before they're kind of ready and sometimes you have to not work to work to do that work like I yeah. find like I in my program I do a lot of reading a lot of like theoretical reading and I find after 10 pages it's like I need like a day and I can like feel it kind of settling I those yes. ideas kind of land where they need to land for me to be able to use them. Even if I'm super inspired, and this is the thing that I hate the most. Like if I've, if I've had a class or read something that just like, I love, I love everything about it. Like, I wish I'd made that, that piece of art, like, oh, this is me. No, I can't think of anything. <laughs> I can't think of anything that I would do to respond to that in that vein. It can take like a week of me doing nothing for yeah. like those ideas ideas or pieces of work or whatever um to just kind of settle find their place mm -hmm. and it might need yeah. a lot of quiet or a lot of downtime to do that I don't know I have nothing to back this up this is my like hypothesis of how things work in my brain but I don't know I experienced that too and you made me realize that I should clarify I mean that this, the the actual like task of making something doesn't take that long, like the actually crossing it off of the to-do list. But there does need to be a lot of that like gestation period. And I think be I get confused that the gestation period length means that the actual like task completing, like physically doing length is going to be long as well. Or it, like I get, gotcha. I get tripped up. Um, yeah thoughts need to organize and I need to not be thinking about them in order for them to organize in my brain too. Totally. And do you notate that in, in your, in your week of uh, debriefs? Have you been writing down like sitting and percolating, brewing, spinning wheel of... I have not been annotating like wheel spinning, thoughts percolating. Um, and I think that would make me feel a lot better if I was doing that or I'd feel a lot better at the end of my days. But I think this is where I'm also like, I'm not very like present in my days. It's really hard for me to recall what I did in a day. Like at the end of the day, I'm like, what? What? I have like the things I did, like if I hop on a call or have class, I'm like, okay, I know the time. I know where I was for this chunk. And like, but the time in between, I'll be like, I know I wrote something. I know I like took some notes or I you know, did that, like, I just, I have, I have nothing. And then if, like, if there's not a meeting bookending things, I have no idea, like, when I had lunch or, like, what I did for these things. It's just, like, an amorphous blob of time and space, all in the same space of my living room kitchen area. Yeah, record keeping in the time of extended isolation. Yeah. How do you, like, how do you do that, Lily? I think has come up for me also this week because I've had such trouble with it. Yeah, well, doing it regularly, no matter what. Mm -hmm. If you've designated a time for that creative work. Um, so 
yeah, I'll, I'll come back to that. But doing it regularly and making sure to notate the days of no productivity and the days of maybe of whatever productivity that I judge. Because like a big part of it is to take notes on how I work in the studio so that I can go back to it and remember that it was normal when I'm judging myself later. Um, Because a big part of it is to, like, quell the critic later on and have proof, like, no, this is normal. (laughs) Um, But I think a big part of everything that this practice is helpful for is the kind of Elizabeth Gilbert (laughs) idea that the artist self is separate. And, or, like, the creative self is separate, separating from mm. the, what does she call it? The familiar, the, you know. Da- and the not demon. everyone, not, not everyone, yeah, not everyone subscribes to that, and that's fine. But for me, I find it helpful um, because, I don't know, my art practice can take me to weird places. I don't want to be there all the time. And mm. I also find it kind of quells the ego like I don't know art isn't a a quite amazing thing it's a thing that I do sometimes and it's a thing that I do um in the studio that's where it happens and that's where I can stop Mm. so kind of having that separation like I walked into the studio the practice is starting let's see if it happens um that, that kind of separation really helps me and if it's part of if there isn't a distinction then this practice might not really help because it's your life and that might work for you. I think like I subscribe to that like creative as separate or subscribe feels like a like twee word to use but like, like and subscribe <laughs> <laughs> um but I think that is necessary for all kind of work whether it be creative work or you know managerial work even though there's creativity in that like I think that's like very vital for mental health um but I think also no I mean I think I still struggle with that I think I like especially moving into design and design that like trying to figure out my own design identity like I'm kind of back in that area of feeling like my worth is tied up in the work that I do and even like picking a thesis topic it's very much like going inside and like what do I care about what do I want to make the world a better place in or how do I want to make the world a better place um that I kind of forgot like I think I'd spent a while like freelancing photographing photographing (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um, and like had gotten to a point where I was like separate and I was doing it for money but I had also lost a lot of like passion for it in that and like it just became really tiresome and like the things that I wasn't good at became even bigger things for me to stress out about like editing and color correction which is the bane of I think most photographers existence um, but so hearing you kind of say that was a nice reminder to kind of like give myself a little bit of extra space and grace and also that like I don't have a separate studio I have a separate ceramic studio but that um and that like feels really easily to be separate because that's my like decompress studio space rather than my work studio space I think something that's I I think there's a kind of contradiction here um in what I'm about to say but like there's something really useful in the exercise of trying to compartmentalize. Um, yeah. You know, even, even if it's, even if it's like moot, even if it's in vain, the idea that like treating your creative practice as a separate thing from like yourself as a person, um, it's, it's helpful in the way that like having work-life balance <laughs> is, is a thing. Like um, I, I started, I took this sort of, when Lily first told me about this system of studio debriefing that she did months ago, um, I started like implementing it. And the the main shift, I think, um, for me mentally was like taking my studio practice out of the soup of <laughs> of my brain and onto um, a designated 
workspace, which at the time I didn't have a separate studio space because we were all under lockdown and I lost access to my studio. But having a notebook where I would go that was specifically designated for um, for the tasks that I was doing related to my creative projects um, made it feel so much more like separate and legit legitimate and uh, and and it gave me this sort of external accountability that I didn't have when it was all just sort of swimming around in my own, you know, uh, tangled up feelings about work and self-worth and creativity and et cetera. And so I like, you know, Lily mentioned like uh, not wanting to end up in your childhood <laughs> uh, during a studio <laughs> session. And that's so true, especially, and I'm, I'm wondering how, if and how, um, you do deal with that, Lily, when that does come up for you. Because in my practice, so much of the work that I do is in like direct response to personal experience or personal history. Um, and sometimes it's inevitable that I, I, I'm, I'm creating work that responds to or treats, um, you know, old, hard to digest memories. Um, but I think having this like system of what did I do this day? What did I, logistically, what did I accomplish? I fixed the printer. I changed the ink in the, in the, um, in totally. the printer. I, you know, reformatted a page. I did X amount of research and, got, you know, like having the, the really concrete things to write down um, gets me out of like dwelling on, uh, it, it turns it from being like therapy <laughs> to um, being, you know, a task and a process and, you know, I put my hand on this rock and climbed up this path this way this day um, rather than being, like, lost in the soup of, like, ah, all I did was think about my past and it wasn't productive. And then having, like, evidence to look at and be, like, here are concrete steps I made towards a project it was super helpful. <laughs> oh, good, good. I mean, so... One thing just I want to say briefly before, like, touching on your question, one reason that I find the separation of artist and, and person really helpful is it's so much easier to take criticism, like any kind of criticism, because it's not you, because your art is so personal. My art can be really personal. It's like, it's like, it's like me. It's granted it's from artist me, but it can be hard to make that separation. So when you get, you know criticism or feedback you never know what's going to sing and it's so much easier to keep it out here to keep it out away where i can see it and integrate it in a more thoughtful way instead of just kind of hurting you know <laughs> then it doesn't matter what it is what it's said because i can deal with it it's it's about what artist lily made and artist lily is you know devoted to surviving and and really learning and getting better in concert with the, the community that I am in. So, you know, I'm mixing she and I, which is, you know, telling. But, um, but anyway, I just want to say, like, the separation, that is one way that I found the separation useful. But I don't know. I, I think the way I, I deal with the personal stuff probably different. Um, sometimes I plummet down you know and when that happens it's gonna happen for a few hours and a few days and I can't control it you know so so writing about it does help um I find that like I'll plummet into if not the past into like real feelings sometimes and ew. I, t I ew I know gross. it's gross <laughs> I'll take notes if I can um, I try to be present for it, even though it's the worst. And when I come back up, I'm a little clearer, but it's just something to experience. And I mm. do compartmentalize emotion as much as I compartmentalize, <laughs> you know, art and art and self the way that we're discussing. Um, <laughs> so it's not friends. something I know it's not something that I do well feel feelings, especially like, you know, the real ones. You know what I mean? The, the like the real feelings. So when that grossness happens, like clear my schedule, 
set lower expectations and just swim and you'll come back up come back up um and try not to make any big decisions don't destroy any paintings um and if you do keep the scraps so i don't know that's just for me what happens i i it's like a big it's like a day and a half or like a week you know grad school made me really self-conscious for like a week and i couldn't i couldn't do it but like you know it, it happens so that's for me um I just lower my expectations, do what I got to do. And then usually I'm a little clearer after mm-hmm. it. Yeah. I think of allowing myself space to feel the feelings as a practice, kind of in the way that we've been talking about it on the pod for however many episodes it's been now. Um, and same with like studio debriefing where like each time I let myself feel my feelings and give myself space to lower expectations, like just with what you're talking about, it makes it like the next time just a little bit easier and like a little bit less daunting. And you're like, okay, I've done this before. I know I can give myself the space and I'll come, I'll come right out of it. And it's beautiful. Beautiful totally. thing to learn. Yeah. I love thinking about it. That was a practice. It's great. Yeah. Kayla, how did your I- studio debrief go? Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> As you, Sorry to, so to, I, make, to, to, to ask a question. I mean, I'm like, yeah, I'm just a guest. You're not allowed to. We ask the questions around here, <laughs> Lily. Um, it, you know, it was, this is something that I've been, um, ever since I discovered that you do this, and I it really inspired me, um, I have tried it in a couple of different ways. I had a notebook where I wrote, like, a table. Um, so I would have a table of, like, the date, what I did, it literally says just what I did, um, and then a little like space for me to write, a, uh, to draw a little smiley face or frowny face or, you know, <laughs> sm- you know middle, middle face, which was just a really nice way to capture like how I was feeling from the end of the day without getting too involved in like why I was feeling however I was feeling. Um, but just to be like, I'm, sa- I'm satisfied with this day or, or not. And I was thinking of it really very much as like and a kind of evidence thing <laughs> because uh, like, like you mentioned, Krista, like it's hard, to, it's hard to keep track of what you did in a day. The, like the amnesia sets in really quickly and then I'm, I'm very, I will very easily start like berating myself internally about having done nothing and accomplished nothing. But then if I've written down like, you know, I, <laughs> I, uh, I did this, this small list of things, um, it, 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 you know, having the evidence there makes me feel like I, I actually made progress. Um, and I like thinking of it rather than as like notes to myself. Um, it feels like I'm recording what I accomplished in a day for a boss that doesn't exist <laughs> um, <laughs> in the same way as like if I were, you know, in, in my office jobs uh, and I, you know, I would have a list of tasks I accomplished and I would review them with my boss or manager. Um, there was, you know, somebody checking in to make sure that I would delivered what I needed to deliver. Um, that can get really lost when you're only accountable to yourself. And so these like studio debriefs um, became a way of doing that. And then like the next day I could be like, okay, where did I, where did I leave off? What, have, what do I have to pick back up on? Um, so it's really, yeah, it was really, it was really helpful and good. <laughs> I'm a fan. Oh. And now I use Notion to do it, uh, <laughs> which now it's all, Automated Look, and in, in case you're, in case anyone wants to sponsor this podcast, Notion. <laughs> Honestly, that'd be great. I mean, you can Please. edit that out, but um, I, I don't know if we should put it out oh. there into the universe. The free publicity will come anyway. Will come anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, I also use Notion like you after seeing yours, Kayla, and I really liked having it using the calendar view and having the daily log like be on each day, which is also like I used a um, a daily planner as my journal when I started journaling because it was a like, you have a page, you can't write anything more than this. Like it took the pressure off of it having like an allotted space for a day. 
um, mm. which helped with the log too. Mm. And I'll say for any like uh, artists listening who like draw or I don't know, who have like super material practices, mm. I find both the notes and deep helpful to keep track of all the weird stuff I do that I forget about. Like during like a drawing session, I might like do a little scribble thing. Like, oh, this is everything. I can totally use this later. Then it goes away out of my brain. So like like if it's the, the notes or the debrief is really detailed, then it's like the scribble pastel thing. Like or like the the the, the I ripped the paper and the rip line was like a horizon. Like gotta do that later. It wasn't practical in the moment to do. Like like keeping track of all like the little things that can mm. like evolve into like a material practice that float out of the brain. Yeah. Yeah end of tangent (laughs) not a tangent (laughs) I think very relevant um I also wanted to ask Lily about your process of like going back and like going combing through these journals and annotating them um because it sounds like you have like a good practice of like annotating to like remember but I'm sure then you forget that you annotated so is there like another layer (laughs) to that like how do you how do you keep reminding yourself of of things when they kind of just like keep piling up or keep lining up in the past to present my uh, metaphor kind I of mean, left there it's kind of just you know for me it's I know when I don't need something anymore mm. you know like eventually something I I highlighted to look up like I don't need to look it up anymore because I know it or something like okay all of those artists all right, I remember why they came up for me in those crits, and I I follow the hashtags now on Instagram, or, like, I bookmarked the book and I, I read it. It's in my brain. Um, you know, maybe it'll fall out, but, like, for now, it's kind of, like, like integrated into my processor. Mm. Um, so as long as I'm doing it regularly... And I'm when I when I'm talking about annotating, I'm going through the whole journal, like quickly, oh. quickly, flipping, flipping, flipping. Like this is grad two. Um, there's like some of wow, some of the so debriefs actually. Pretty. Um, and then awesome. you know eventually, like, what's this? Listen to talk art. <laughs> um, I remember that episode. Like I don't need to go back to it. Um, you know, I, I looked up um, Vic Muniz's Verso series. Like, I don't need to go back to it. Um, eventually, it's kind of it's there. Or I've moved yeah. on from it. Because, you know, influence is kind of wax and wane. Yeah. So, yeah, that's not super, that's not super, like, a uh, uh, specific answer. It's just, like, you go through until it's kind of there or not needed anymore. And this one, I, I should probably go back. What is implied in material seems interesting I don't know <laughs> so um yeah and then we've spoken a little bit about this off off the pod but how does that extend to your like more tactile things and kind of record keeping or book I don't know if they're record the, the things that you collect for your practice whether it be materials or drawings like do you do the same thing for that yeah, so um, I hoard materials. It's the one thing, it's the one place in my life where Marie Kondo does not apply. Um, <laughs> I find that if it's a material, and I recommend this to like artists that work with materials, honestly, if it's something that comes into your life for free or for cheap or that seems kind of cool, like just save it. Like you never know. You honestly never know. And and having it just gives you so many opportunities to just go and explore and test, like, I think testing is really important. So, but the thing is, I often forget what I have, especially when it's, like, compacted for space. So something I try to do regularly is just go through it, reorganize it, refold it. Um, and in that process of going through, I'll, you know, find things that I forgot I had or find things where it's like, all right, it's time, it's time for this now. Um, or you know, things that absolutely, like, I'm not ready for, but I know, like, all right, this kind of 
Jersey material. Like, you know, I, I could, like, people have told me to experiment with this kind of material. I don't want to right now, but I should probably keep it. Um, so, so yeah, I, I often, if, like, between things or um, maybe, like, once a month, I kind of go through everything that I have and... Um, it usually needs to be folded because during that month I probably like opened it and looked for something and closed it. So going through what I have often, um, I, I find it's a good uh, practice for me. Um, yeah. I also wanted to ask on a separate train of thought. Um, so you, you are someone who grew up playing music in a pretty hard core way. Um, and I was wondering, we spoke a little bit about this um, outside of, out of this, but um, you, your relationship to practice uh, growing up, I wonder how that relates to your relationship to your art practice now. Yeah, who knows, man. So I grew up playing <laughs> classical violin. Um, my family, my mom's family was all about classical music and everyone played something my mom was a cellist and a soprano um everyone did something and i remember in second grade i was at my my auntie gina's uh who was a music teacher their winter performance and it was like all these kids my age playing classical music and i was like damn i'm slacking so i was like mom i think i should start playing violin and um i did and you know, it. I enrolled in like a music school, and um, I you you start having to practice every day. And um, at violin lessons, you're given exercises, and to move up the the school that I was in involved a lot of like you had juries, which is when you when you play in front of a panel, and they decide if you're advancing enough like a few little eight-year-old oh um, on weekends on Saturdays I had an ensemble group and I had music theory class if you were a minute late they locked the door um, I was always late I, I did not get my music theory um, up to par <laughs> and um, and you have a violin lesson so um, it was that kind of thing so to move up in a jury situation you just have to practice a lot and practice is the word that is repeated more than any word is practice 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 like they were way ahead of you guys but no not not just kidding <laughs> um and so or, or like i come home from school like you practice like okay i'll practice it was just it's just a refrain so i did that until i was around 17 or 18 and i um the, the better or you get or the more competent you get, the more intense the situations are. So I eventually was in a youth symphony that was kind of amazing. I think we were ranked third in the country at the time. Um, our uh, wow. conductor, her name was Camilla Kolchinski. She was like the first woman to graduate from the St. Petersburg Conservatory um, family of Holocaust survivors. She knew a lot of the composers that we were playing, um, and Whoa. they expected a lot, and I was the worst one. <laughs> it was one of the worst ones because I, I didn't, and, and I don't mean that as a judgment, I, but I wasn't practicing three hours a day, and because I was doing other things. Um, we had a soloist. We went on tour one summer, and a, a soloist who was around our age, so in high school, came with us. Um, at least three hours a day, often like three to six was how often she practiced. Um, so it's a lot of discipline. And eventually I stopped, you know, because I just wanted to do other things. I wanted a job. I wanted to draw and it just, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Um, but it kind of taught me how to listen to classical music, but, um, but I, I wanted to do other things and I couldn't spend all of the time that was needed to keep my muscles knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. So, I, and Kayla, I'm sure you can relate from martial arts too, but like the discipline is definitely important, kind of helps set my expectations for how much, how many hours something will take. Like, I, like I'm 
okay spending a lot of hours doing something technical because it's like, I don't know, yeah, an hour is how you learn a scale. Like, you know, it's, and three hours is how long it takes to get competent at like a four octave scale. Like, and even then, you're probably going to sound a little screechy. So, um, <laughs> So, I don't know, I think it helps set my expectations. The discipline is not always there in the same way because I'm a little kinder <laughs> to myself now. And and I don't have a, you know, I don't have an art teacher that I check in with once a week who, like, puts me through my paces. It's all in my head. So, mm -hmm. there's no, like, external system, even in grad school, for it the same way. So, anyway, yeah, if you're in the classical mu music world, you will hear the word practice more than any other word and it means engagement and rigor and that's and it's beautiful it, it, it can be really beautiful because it's like within this sorry I'm talking too much but like within this, oh. the constraints of this world you are so free if you are if you decide that that's that's right for you then it's like you are you are probably in love with the music. You you have a kind of a safe world where you're going to be teaching, you're going to be touring, you're going to be um, uh, in rehearsals and performing. You have your black clothes for performing, and that's your you have a community of your ensemble, and um, you're not getting paid very much. But um, anyway, um, mm -hmm. but it takes practice. Mm -hmm. And it takes refinement. Like, you know, you're not going to have time to specialize in other things. So there you yeah. go. It's, it's hours. And it's also, I think, one of the most, uh, I don't know, one of the takeaways from that kind of disciplined practice is also, like, that you just repeat the same thing over and over and over and over. And for a long time, it is bad. <laughs> it's it. <laughs> It's terrible. You're producing a thing that sucks, um, but you have to keep doing it. Um, and it's boring. Which is, yeah. It's so boring. It can be boring repeated this, repeating the same scale over and over. I would just get bored, like, doing it, which is why I never really, yeah. I mean, hearing both what both of you guys are saying, I'm like, that's why I never even stuck with any instrument. Like, I hated the practicing. It was so boring. Like, I quit violin, I quit flute, I quit piano. I was, like, a serial musical instrument quitter. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, I had the support and encouragement. <laughs> um, do you think you also, like, burned out on it, Lily? Or do you think it was the, the boredom and just wanting to have space for more variety in life? I don't, I don't know. It, it was just wanting space for variety. I loved the discipline. I loved the music. Um, but, you know, it was, I also wanted, I got this opportunity to get a job at a science museum on the weekend. So it was Ooh. really cool. And it just would have, it would mean I couldn't drive an hour every Sunday to a four hour practice. Like, yeah, I just wanted to do other things. Yeah. You're a Gemini, who can blame you? <laughs> yeah. Just gotta have have multiple interests. Yeah. Can't can't tie me down. <laughs> Do you still have a violin? Yeah, that's a long story. I do. It's not mine. And it's it's yeah. But I, I have it. I have it. It's not a story for the podcast though. Okay. I think I've heard it before. Um I wasn't sure if what I remembering was something that that was relating to you or someone else, but mm. maybe it's it is interesting. I, I feel weird now. They should go back into it. Um, no, you don't I do have, have to. a violin. My uh, a good <laughs> friend of my my family who collects instruments, like rare instruments, lent me this violin in in high school, and it's beautiful and it has an amazing mm. sound, and it's like kind of valuable. I didn't know that during high school and someone in my high school like put it in the dumpster once it was like I was like oh well that's my violin sorry I put it in the wrong place in the hallway but this violin is like rare and worth a lot of money um but our, our very generous friend well you know has wanted me to hold on to it just in case just in case I would like to play and he's amazing and wonderful 
I don't think I'll play again, though, and I feel, you know, I want the violin to be played. So about once a year, I'll text him saying, like, can I give you this back? Um, so, but I still have it. So who knows? Maybe I'll, you know, find me on the corner doing scale <laughs> one day. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, get a little extra I, shopping I think... money while you practice. Right. <laughs> uh, I think... Well, before we kind of wrap this up, I think there's there's a really interesting thing that we forget when there's a more kind of open-ended practice, like a creative practice that's a little bit less structured than like skill acquirement. Um, when you're acquiring a skill, whether it's music or a language or uh, some kind of sport, <laughs> uh, you know, there's there's a certain amount of like repetitive slogging through that happens um, that, you know, when we're in our creative practice, whether that's getting your design assignments done or your, uh, you know, your own self-directed art projects, um, it's really easy to kind of blame yourself and, and not, um, not to see it as a sort of like, sometimes practice just means making shitty things for a while <laughs> until you, you know, build that muscle, um, you know, and when it's all kind of internalized, it's about like your own, my own creativity and personality and all of those things that are intrinsically me. And if I'm not doing well in the studio, then I'm failing as a person and separating those out as being like, you know, there's a certain discipline and rigor that can be separate from you as a person. <laughs> which I think, I feel like the studio debriefs address. Yeah. I would like to add that I found them very useful, even though I struggled with them. <laughs> I want to make that clear. Like, I think there is a lot of value in them and I'm like planning on keeping doing them. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think 75% of the battle is remembering to do them and doing them, mm. uh, especially on bad days. Um, on good days, it's easy because you're like, yeah, I did this thing and then I finished this project and then like, it's, it's easy. It's, it's the, the meh days and just remembering is like most of it. Thanks, Lily. And thanks for, for joining us. Um, we'll put Lily's uh, website and Instagram uh, in the show description if you want to check out her work. And we highly recommend that you do. Thanks so much for listening and see you next time on Practice Practice with Krista and Kayla. Thanks to Xander Wickstrom for the use of our theme song, What Do I Do Now? A real bop. 